um, and at least introduce to you um, resolution and variance. I probably won't post this, uh, this seven minutes until uh, uh, after tomorrow's lecture. Um, so um, <clears throat> what I'm going to cover in, in resolution and variance and, and what you would not do um, homework on if, you, um, uh, if we decide to drop lab four um, are these, uh, these concepts. Okay? Um, and, and here, you know, I'm, I'm really going away from the physical model. I'm going to talk more about the statistical model, if you remember that from the beginning of the class. Um, I'm going to talk much more about statistics um, and, uh, uh, and I'm, and I'm going to talk uh, much less about physical processes. Uh, now I, I understand that you know noise uh, is still caused by physical processes, even if the noise is introduced, say, you know, as um, as thermal noise in an amplifier circuit, okay, in an analog amplifier circuit. Even there, it's still caused by physical processes, and um, we are, you know, we are observing physical processes at the macro scale, uh, and maybe not in the transistor of an amplifier circuit, but but. Um, um, you know, certainly in all our recordings and all the waves that we record, everything our geophone records, okay, are all macro scale physical processes. So, you know, the quantum mechanical effect effects are way too small to be seen. Okay, maybe you know, in a in an amplifier, um, you know, we're seeing uh, we're uh, uh, we're seeing thermal noise that's affected by quantum mechanics. Okay, so so we know. That there's really nothing that um, uh, there's nothing that is absolutely random about our noise. No matter how random our noise looks, it's not random. Okay, and, and actually, a lot of my career has been taking parts of seismograms and seismic records that that people have regarded as noise, and they haven't had much luck. Um, uh, treating it as random noise because it's absolutely not random. It's very coherent, um, you know, such as source generated uh, noise like uh, uh, surface waves, uh, and and trying to make some you know make some something good out of that out of that noise. Okay, that's been a lot of my career, um, and I'll show you an example uh, in a week or two where uh, we have. Um, um, you know, a whole a whole uh, uh, plethora of of deep crustal reflections observed in some seismic sections. Okay, yet they are perfectly repeatable in time. They don't vary in time. You come back one, you know, you 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 record a, what looks like an extremely noisy section, and you come back the next day and you shoot it again in the same place, and you get exactly the same waveforms. Okay, which means that every one of those little bumps in this noisy seismogram is really something down there, okay, or some effect of something that's really down there. Um, so, and, and I've I've uh, I've made a lot of my career out of out of finding ways to, uh, if not figure out exactly what's down there, at least finding ways of of summarizing everything that's down there. And producing all those little bumps, you know, from macro scale physical processes that are actually not random. Okay, but uh, so so we're making progress, you know, in dealing with noise, uh, and and in fact, uh, um, empirical Green's functions are the realization they came they they were invented after the realization that noisy seismograms are 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 really not noise. There's really something in there. These are real waves, and we can actually make them. We can actually make them do something. Okay, we can get something out of them. <clears throat> uh, so, so this this resolution and variance part here is is still admitting that we don't understand the physical processes, 
and we are we're going to take some part of our data and regard it as random noise, even though we know now that it's really not. In in modern seismic recordings, uh, there's there's really there's really no random noise. Okay, it just looks like it. Okay, but our understanding is incomplete. Our data recordings are incomplete, and we can still benefit from regarding um, regarding uh, uh, part of our data as random noise. You know, that's not predictable by anything. Okay, um, but there are still some some quantum. You know, there there are still some things that show up. You know, even for the very the very predictable parts of our data, we can only predict them so well. And this gets to the topic of uncertainty principles. And we're going to look at an uncertainty principle that is actually exactly the same as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. Okay, it's actually exactly the same uncertainty principle, and and we're going to apply it to seismograms. Um, and uh, the way you often see uncertainty principles expressed is, say, uh, uh, delta t times delta omega has to be uh, greater than or equal to some constant. And that constant cannot be 0. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, you know, that means that now, now, what are delta t? These are, not, these are not time and frequency sampling. These are time and frequency ranges. Okay, so Clairbout makes that a little bit clearer, I think, by using the capital Greek letter lambda. So this uh, a without a crossbar is a is a capital Greek lambda, and so he uses that to represent you know the range of t lambda t times lambda omega. The range of frequency is greater than or equal to to the constant. Okay, and the constant cannot be zero, which means that no matter what you do. You've got, you know, even if you have a very small range in t, you've got a really big range in uh, in frequency. Okay, so I'll uh, uh, we'll delve into this tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm continuing in, in resolution variance here, and the um, uh, the first thing that we're going to look at are some uncertainty principles. Um, and uh, we're going to look at a trade-off. Uh, you know, uncertainty principles are trade-offs, right? You can you can uh, you can know the the frequency very accurately, but then you don't know where it is in time very accurately. Okay, because the lengths of these two have to have to when multiplied together, they have got to be equal to uh, the, you know they can't be zero. Uh, you can know the uh, uh, the time that something occurred very accurately, but then you don't know the frequency of that event very accurately. You know the span of frequency that that can can uh, range over is is very large. So that's what uh, that's what that uncertainty principle is about. That's essentially Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Um, the uh, um, the resolution ver versus variance trade-off is very similar. Um, so uh, you've got some kind of complex and probably noisy uh, seismogram, say, and um, uh, the uh, delta m, the uh, your uncertainty in the what the value of the mean uh, times delta tau, which is your uncertainty in what time that that value occurs at. Okay. That's also another uncertainty principle that where that product has to be greater than or equal some non-zero constant. Um, so, and, and looking at this, I think you can uh, um, you can get a sense of that, right? So, if we take this complicated, noisy function. And I, I did mean it to be single valued at every time, uh, but I, I drew it sloppily. Um, and you uh, say do a moving window average over that. Okay, you'll get a uh, an estimate of the mean, and and uh, you know the uh, the wider the window you use, the smaller the standard deviation is going to be, right? Because the mean comes with a standard deviation, and so you could put an, an error bar on on this and. Uh, now I gotta switch to the 
the other kind of um, cursor. Okay. Um, so so there is an the, you know there's an error bar around this mean, and the wider that the uh, for for most functions or most complicated functions most data the wider your delta tau okay then the smaller that error bar is going to be but then you know delta tau is larger and so you know where does that exact value occur well you know somewhere in here that's the uncertainty okay resolution versus variance the higher the resolution the higher the variance in the result um, my favorite uh, topic within this little section is the power spectrum of noise. Okay, um, and and there's kind of a uh, a tautology here, uh, apparently, that uh, uh, if you you know you might have heard that uh, um, you know incandescent light, white light, at least over your visual range, is um, um, uh, it's white because its spectrum is flat over your visual range, right? It's just as much power in the blue as there is in the in the yellow as there is in the red, okay? As there is in the green. So uh, so the spectrum of white light is flat, and uh, if you've uh, you know studied uh, uh, black body radiation, you know that uh, there's um, uh, you know, an object at a certain temperature is going to have a, uh, uh, you know, basically hitting you with random waves of, uh, you know, random photons of random energies. And so, you know, a low energy photon is going to look red and a higher energy photon is going to look blue. Um, so what you're really looking at, and this is why it's called white noise, you know, um, the, the spectrum of white noise is supposed to be flat. Okay, and you know you're doing a spectral analysis by looking at a white light, and yeah, the spectrum's flat because it appears white, at least if you're not colorblind. Um, so, um, you know, it makes sense to us that that uh, uh, if we have some noisy data, uh, and and we believe that the uh, uh, the the spectrum of that of that noise is uh, is white, okay, and we do and we do a Fourier transform, we should get a flat line, right? A at least where there's where it's all noise. So if you if you did a uh, uh, you know you looked uh, say um, at the interval before the arrival of the P wave, you know on some on some station, and of course there's noise there, okay, and if you you know, if you can pick one that's not obviously coherent noise, you know, like the wind blowing or, or, uh, uh, or, or a truck passing by the station, uh, you know, if you pick uh, uh, some noise interval like that that seems incoherent, uh, and you pick out just that, that area and you Fourier transform it, um, you'll find, oh, it's anything but flat. The spectrum of noise is not flat. In fact, uh, uh, for any sample data, the spectrum of noise looks a whole lot like noise. Okay, so you know the noise is bouncing up and down, and the spectrum of that noise is also bouncing up and down unpredictably. You never get that flat line. Okay, um, and I'll tell you why. You know we can. Uh, uh, we can get that flat line if we look at something in analog, and maybe that's a testament to the high data rates in my, you know, between my eye and my brain, you know, that um, uh, that I can uh, I can perceive the analog continuity, okay, of that. Um, no, actually, the reason I can perceive the flat spectrum of noise of of the light as white is because the um, the the spectrum is taken in analog within the the cones of my uh, uh, of my uh, uh, retina. Okay, so the cone neurons in my retina are are actually taking the spectrum in analog. Okay, um, and uh, uh, 
But you know, if if instead I was uh, dealing with the digitized data of the firing of the neurons, you know, between the cones and 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 the backside of my brain, then um, um, I would not get this white perception. I would see I would see you know it would look it would look speckly and sparkly. Um, and when you analyze noise, you know, in a seismogram on a computer, you never get that flat white spectrum. Okay, and uh, and and you have to do the only way to get the flat spectrum from noise is to do is to get the spectrum in analog. You know, like with a prism or with a cone cell. Um, now that's related to this central limit theorem, which is the last thing in the first half of the class. Um, which says uh, if you perform any operation, add them, subtract them, multiply them, convolve them, um, uh, do their uh, not the Fourier transform. Fourier, you don't no no not transforms. If you perform any any uh, any operation, um, you know that that combines two data sets. Okay, and, and we're not talking about the analysis of data. We're talking about you know combination of data. So you take two random series, you combine them in any way, take their cross correlation, um, add them up, um, add up their frequency com, add them in the frequency domain. Okay, the uh, the distribution of amplitude values in the result is going to look more and more Gaussian. Okay, so you have you know your data z is equal to a times the the x time series plus b times the y time series, and uh, and you could start with with two perfectly random uh, um, x's and, and y's, and you combine them with some operation into z. Okay, then z is going to be more Gaussian than the uh, um, uh, than the than the inputs. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, and to the extent that uh, you know, data, non-random data, uh, or not, or coherent noise, you know, to the extent that they're complex, they will also do the same thing. So you can have, you know, here's the amplitude distribution of uh, of some uh, data set, okay, and uh, here's the amplitude distribution of a different data set. Okay, very complex. You know, not not a not a simple amplitude distribution either. And you combine them, you're going to get something that looks more like a Gaussian. And uh, you can even keep combining um, two, uh, you know, mathematically uh, uh, mathematical sources of of comp of um, random numbers. And the more you combine, the more Gaussian it is. In fact, that's uh, that's actually how to uh, how to get a, a, a a uh, random number set that has a Gaussian distribution. Um, so uh, uh, you know, if you roll if you roll one die, right, and uh, um, and you just roll it over and over again. So you roll a die, and the and the and the number that pops up is the one that uh, that you write down for that element of the time series. Roll the die again for the next element of the time series. Okay, you'll get a you know that should be a that should be white noise, right? It's equally Likely that you'll get any one of those uh, uh, any one of those six numbers should be equally likely. You know, you got a loaded die if you if you if you don't. <clears throat> okay, if you roll two dies, if you roll two dice and you add them together, then that distribution is going to be more Gaussian, and so it's going to be centered. You know, uh, the average. Uh, uh, well, the average isn't going to change. The average is between three and four, right? I'm sorry. The average of the sum um, is is going to be between six and seven, right? But um, uh, you know, snake eyes come up a lot less often um, than uh, uh, that something that adds to uh, six or seven. Okay, so it's going to have this Gaussian um, distribution. Now I'm always showing, you know, because we're talking about seismograms and noise on seismograms, you know, I'm very often showing amplitude distributions that are centered at zero amplitude, you know, and and there's equal numbers of negative samples as there are positive samples. But that's that's really just my my seismogram, you know, 
bias here. So to understand um, noise, we've got to, and, and to understand random processes, we have to get used to this um, idea called the expectation. Um, the expectation is kind of a, 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 a theory of, uh, of dealing with, uh, with random processes. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, the expectation is a theoretical average over an or the ensemble of possible data, okay? The data where the data are coming from a random process. All right. So there's several several words we have to understand there. Um, we implement the expectation via this um, uh, this averaging process, right? This is just taking the average over some number of samples. Okay, so x sub t is a time series produced by a random process, and we say the expected value for x is going to be the average. The, and this is a time average, right? Uh, and so that's why I, I canceled out the equal sign. Uh, no, this is not this is not what the expectation is defined as. This is this is an approximation. This is how we, you know, we implement, we find the expectation for uh, you know some uh, some real operation, okay? And that's because we never have the ensemble, and I'll I'll have to explain that uh, some more. Okay, so uh, the expectation as implemented gives us an average over time of a random series. Um, and, and as you can see, the expectation that, that the value from this expectation that we get, right, the average value that we get depends on how much time we include. What's our n? If the n is one, then the average is going to be, you know, is going to vary like crazy. If the n is 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 a month long, it's going to be pretty stable. Okay. So if, if n is a month's worth of samples, right, two billion samples. Um, okay, so theoretically, the 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 value x in our random that we get out of this random process, it's one possible outcome. Another way of expressing it that you'll see is it's one the result of one experiment, or it is one realization of a random process. Okay, and that random process actually generates many realizations. Okay. And, and, and here's where you know the scientific writers uh, uh, they they I mean I'm sorry the science fiction writers um, looked at the uh, did I start recording I think I did okay the science fiction writers you know looked at what uh, uh, um, what the mathematicians were doing with the expectation and with the with the ensemble. And they, you know, they they went out into this uh, idea of of uh, you know multiple alternative universes and all that. Okay, so that's where that you know that Doctor Who science fiction idea came from. Um, so uh, you know, every time you roll a die, uh, or you know, say with Schrodinger's cat, you know, you open the box and the cat's either dead or alive, right? And so. Uh, um, the uh, 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 before you open the box, there's two possible futures. Before you roll the die, there's six possible futures. Okay, and and every time you roll that die and observe a number, you're picking one of six possible forks in reality, or so the science fiction writers say. Okay. I mean, we know there's uh, at least all that I can deal with is one reality. That's hard enough, and so we are, you know, we are following one realization. Okay, but there are lots of geophysicists even who, who uh, you know, they they create random models and uh, and they they will do millions billions of realizations of the random process just to make sure. That they understand everything that that random process could do. What are all the forks that can happen? So just you know, just you know, rolling us you know, um, 
I roll a die once, and I, I've gone on to one of six possible futures. Each of those six possible futures, you know, if there's a second die roll, then it branches into six more possible futures. Okay, we got 36. Okay, we roll a die, the die a third time, six times, you know, 36 times six possible futures. Okay, by the time you've rolled a die 100 times, you know, you've got, you know, more possible futures than there are protons in the universe. So there's no hope of keeping track of them all. And so a lot of what our, what our geophysicists who deal with random processes are trying to do is, is figure out, okay, how can I do a finite number of realizations and yet still explore you know, all, you know, the, all of the important space that's, that's generated by these, by, uh, within the ensemble? So here's a, a, a view you know, um, of... Uh, uh, Here's a view of, of uh, uh, you know, one of the ensemble. It's, it's a tiny, tiny piece of the ensemble, right? The ensemble is uh, has way more than uh, um, the ensemble's got got way more than ten to the sixtieth power uh, seismograms in it, and we happen to be on this X three. That's 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 the reality that we're experiencing. Okay, that's the realization that we're on, and the values that that die roll or the random process takes um, in uh, in there. But you know, nearby there's a you know here's here's a different possible future. You know, it forked off you know ten die rolls ago, and this one forked off a million die rolls ago, and you know, um, and and the, and uh, and they're all there. So what is the uh, what is the expectation? Okay, the expectation is the average, the expectation of x at time t is the average at time t across the entire ensemble, right? And so can we do it? No. <laughs> we can never do the expectation, okay? That's what it's supposed to be, uh, but we can't do it uh, for, any, for any interesting random process. Well, you know, uh, there have been some cases where you know the mathematician or the physicist is able to break down the. Uh, uh, you know, there aren't so many possibilities, or there aren't so many samples that you can, you know, you can at least conceive of finding the ensemble and averaging through it. But for seismograms, no way. Okay, there's just too many samples of seismograms. And there's there's too much forking of of, of uh, possible futures at every sample in the seismograms, so uh, we just you know, for us the ensemble is is purely theoretical. Okay. Uh, now you know we're not saying that 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 each seismogram is purely random. You know there there's a there's a deterministic component, and every every single every single potential future. Every single seismogram in the ensemble has the same deterministic component. It's got the same p arrivals. It's got the same uh, Rayleigh wave arrivals. Um, it's got the same uh, you know station effects. It's got the same source uh, effects. Okay, um, but where there are random processes within those, okay, then that's where we generate more members of the ensemble. All right, so so the ensemble every every member you know this is this is somewhat sim this makes some um, some this gives us some simplicity that the deterministic content of every uh, seismogram every x sub i time series in the ensemble has the same dis deterministic content, and then there's random noise and there's convolutional noise added, okay, or convolved in. And each of those each of those seismograms is a different state. Um, you know, it's a different possible future, as the uh, science fiction writers would put it. Um, so, uh, you know, we we, uh, we for us the ensemble is too big to to actually evaluate because we would have to average versus time the uh, the entire ensemble the over the entire ensemble of data. Um, and so, uh, 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 really, uh, uh, 
what we're going to try to do is try to figure out the the character of the random process such that we can uh, we can make a better prediction for the expectation even though we don't have the ensemble. Okay. So um, gotta gotta start somewhere, right? So let's make a really you know a really foolish assumption. We'll assume the data series is ergodic. Okay. Um, ergodic means that the statistical properties of the random process don't change over time. Okay, the deterministic properties uh, of our seismogram, I mean, those can change, right? We have different arrivals coming in at different times, okay, but uh, different reflections coming in at different times. Um, you know, so that's not ergodic at all. But uh, you know, what if we what if we decide, all right? You know, most of the noise that we got here is the wind blowing in the bushes. You know, and during the time of our seismogram, right, we record a two-second seismogram from an exploration project, and during that whole time, the wind is shaking the bushes about as hard. It's coming from the same direction. So, it's all right. So the statistics of that, of that, you know, random or apparently random bush shaking. Actually, it's not random at all, right? Um, but uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, turbulence, wind, uh, flow of water—they do look pretty darn random. Okay, um, but at least we could say, all right, that random process is ergodic, and thus uh, its statistical properties—you know, the kind of die we're rolling—we're rolling a six-sided die instead of a twelve-sided die. All right, the kind of die we're rolling is not changing. Okay, during the during our analysis. Okay, if that's true, then we can use the time average to approximate the expectation. Okay, uh, another way, another way of saying that that our uh, our random process doesn't change with time is that the, the the random part of the data series is stationary. Okay, now you'll see in a lot of my uh, verbiage here. I, I'm following Clairbout and. And again, Clairbout, you know, ignores the obvious uh, for simplicity. Okay, so Clairbout, after saying, you know, the expectation, uh, you know, uh, after saying that that every member of the ensemble has the same deterministic component, then he quickly forgets about the deterministic component, and we're just talking about the random processes here. So, so you know, here I'm saying the whole data series is stationary. Well, that's not strictly true. It can be ergodic if it has a non-stationary deterministic part. In other words, we could predict the deterministic part uh, and take it out. Okay, and what we would have left is just the random part. All right, and 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 that uh, we're saying is stationary for uh, uh, and and. Uh, it's stationary if and only if it's ergodic. Okay, here's a corollary to this definition of of, er, of an ergodic uh, random process. The stationarity means that the autocorrelation of the random time series x sub t is the same at every time. Okay, or well, and let's say maybe more accurately, at every lag. Okay. The autocorrelation of x of t is the same at every lag t. All right. So our, 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 if, if we have a stationary noise series, x of t, and we take the autocorrelation of x, right, which I defined earlier, okay, then it's going to be a flat line. It's going to have the same value at every time t. Um, now, uh, uh, you know the the cheater's way of 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 making your data ergodic without having to completely um, model your um, um, you know without having to 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 uh, deal with modeling your your uh, deterministic processes. So that uh, I mean the the best way is you. You have a, a, a spectacular and accurate physical model 
of your or physics based model of your of your data, and um, and so you model your seismogram, and after you subtract your synthetic seismogram from your your data seismogram, all you have left is random noise. Okay, and that's very hard. Okay, we're you know we're getting closer all the time, but it's very hard. Okay, so so we often we often cheat by chopping up our our seismogram into different ranges. So that's why you see papers where you know they just look at the at the S wave, you know, so from a whole suite of seismograms, they'll chop out the S wave arrival, you know, maybe two seconds of it. They'll look at the PN wave, you know. Uh, so that's that's uh, what that's doing is it's 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 splitting up the seismogram into easily modeled, you know, easily understood uh, uh, stationary parts, where the whole the whole thing, the whole part that you chop out of the seismogram. Uh, you know that you lift out of the size area. That whole part is stationary, even including the deterministic part. Okay, so uh, uh, that's our that's our you know uh, quick and dirty method of 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 getting uh, ergodic signals out out of our data. Okay, the best way is to is to model it totally and subtract you know then subtract the the synthetic that has all the physics from the from the from the data. All right. Now uh, I think I'll have time to, here to get through this time frequency uncertainty. Um, so uh, uh, this this uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle basically says that uh, uh, the time span times the frequency bandwidth, uh, and another way of saying it is that the the uh, time accuracy, the time precision versus the frequency precision. Okay, uh, you multiply those two together, and you're you're going to get a, a value that is no smaller than one half. That's the constant. Okay, for any um, for any wave. Okay, um, and and here's a proof. All right, well let's uh, let's let's get a uh, um, let's get a measure of delta t. All right. So we have a uh, you know some some data series, some time series f of t. Okay. Doesn't matter what it is. All right. And um, uh, and and this uh, um, this ratio here is called the uh, standard second moment of f. All right. And you can see it's related to the energy, so it's it's kind of the uh, you know um, uh, you can see the energy is taken out here, it's uh, normalized to the energy, uh, and and we're looking at at how uh, um, you know how the 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 uh, uh, the time plays off against the time squared plays off against the amplitude squared, okay. So that's the that's delta t squared, all right. Um, all right. So uh, delta omega, what's that? Well, that's just the same thing. It's the same second moment, but applied in omega instead of t. And so here's the Fourier transform of f, okay. And uh, we're we're taking its magnitude squared, all right. And we're normalizing by that, and we're we're looking at the progression versus uh, omega uh, squared. And that's going to be our uh, delta omega squared. So we write in, uh, um, uh, you know, we multiply these. Okay, so we have delta t times delta omega, and we're going to leave it squared. So that's one over the magnitude of f uh, to the fourth power. You know, we haven't said anything about what f is yet, um, and uh, we have uh, an integral over uh, t squared f times f squared dt. And we have an integral of uh, omega squared times uh, uh, the magnitude of f at uh, omega uh, squared d omega. Okay. Now um, there's a uh, substitution we can make here, and and you'll see a lot of this now. You know we're we've got integrals, and we're uh, we make some substitutions to uh, simplify things. Okay, so uh, this uh, magnitude, you know, really what we have here is the magnitude, the omega times f 
and take that magnitude and square it. Okay, and so that is um, um, that is actually uh, uh, equal to, um, and, and we're kind of factoring out a, a minus i here, right? Very tricky. So this is uh, minus i times omega times f, uh, the Fourier transform of f at omega, uh, magnitude of all that, and squared. That's the same. Okay, we can substitute that in. Um, now uh, uh, we also um, uh, notice that this is uh, the same as uh, df dt, right? Um, it's uh, it's f prime, really. It's the time derivative of uh, of f, right? That's that Fourier dual again that I forgot to tell tell you about at the beginning of the class. Okay. So uh, now we have uh, one over um, uh, one over uh, magnitude of f to the fourth power integral of t squared times f squared dt, and now we have integral of f prime squared dt, and we can apply two Schwartz's inequalities. That's why I, I introduced Schwartz's inequalities to you anyway. Um, and uh, what we've got then is that. Uh, uh, f squared dt, the integral of f squared dt times the integral of some g squared dt is greater than or equal to uh, the magnitude of the integral of f times g dt squared. Okay, so short, you know, we we, we basically just just combining two Schwartz's inequalities, and the the uh, greater than sign, you know, just uh, falls right through there. Um, so uh, now we have uh, delta t times delta omega is greater than or equal to 1 over f squared times the magnitude of the, uh, um, uh, of the integral of t times f times f prime dt. And we can integrate the right side by parts. Okay, So uh, this integral, right, this integral here. Is uh, one half t f squared evaluated from uh, minus uh, infinity to infinity, and since t is right there, okay, and f squared is always positive, okay, that's going to evaluate to uh, to zero, and then we have uh, minus one half uh, f squared dt, right, and so that's uh, uh, the integral of f squared dt, and really, so what that is is. Uh, you know the whole thing now uh, is one half f uh, magnitude of f squared, okay? And uh, and there's where that where that comes from, okay? Um, so now we have delta f delta omega is equal to is greater than or equal to one over magnitude of f squared times one half times the magnitude of f squared, okay? Cross out the magnitudes of f squared, and we get delta t delta omega is greater than or equal to one half. Now, now you know, there's uh, okay. So there's that trick in uh, you know combining the integrals, um, and 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 uh, putting in uh, Schwartz's inequality. Uh, those are all important. What is actually less important is you know what is our what is our measure of, of delta t or delta omega? Okay, and uh, 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 you could actually change, and I think that's in lab four. You could actually change it to say a rise time definition instead of second moment. You could use a rise time definition of delta t and delta omega, you know, rise uh, frequency, and um, uh, and you'll end up with the same the same. Uh, uh, you might get a different constant, but you get the same, you know, time frequency uncertainty. All right. So, um, um, what this is telling us is that, you know, the part of the the time where we have our energy times the part of the the span of of the frequency, the frequency bandwidth where we have our energy. You multiply those two together, you're always going to get greater than a half. All right. Which means we can never, you know, if we we can never narrow our energy down to being at one spot in time and one spot in uh, in frequency. Okay, 
we can't we can't invent and we can never have data that look like, uh, but we can't even theoretically invent a Dirac delta function, right? Which is at one precise time and nowhere else. But that Dirac delta function has a because it's at at you know has a span of zero time, it has to have an infinite bandwidth. That Dirac delta function. Uh, we can't we can't make a limited band uh, Dirac delta function. You know it's going to be it's going to as soon as we limit the band, it's going to have some time width too. Can't can't ever be zero. Uh, and, and if you think about it, or if you've taken uh, um, uh, quantum mechanics, you'll recognize that this is actually the exact Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Okay, uh, since particles are waves, and the locations of, of of waves are defined by spatial Fourier spectra, so this this would be uh, uh, location and this would be uh, the uh, uh, the spatial uh, frequency, and so really the spatial frequency is is giving you uh, momentum, and the location is uh, is the uh, 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 location is, is is just x the location. Uh, so this is you know this is our time frequency. This is our Heisenberg uncertainty principle expressed in terms. That, that are obvious for uh, seismograms, but um, uh, it, it is exactly the uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle of uh, quantum mechanics. Um, okay, so uh, you know it's it's going to hold in uh, in our work too, and there, there's you know it's it's theoretical, so there's you know. And this is proof for any function f, right? Complex, real, you know, sinusoidal, what have you, any function. Okay, um, it only has to be a function such that you could do these integrations, right? That these integrations are defined. Um, so uh, uh, you know, it can't be uh, the function can't be something entirely non-physical. Okay. Um, and and it, it shows you why the bandwidth of the uh, of the Dirac delta function is is infinite. Okay, so so this is this is one of these things, you know, because it is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This is one of these things. There is no way around it. It holds in the physical world. It holds in all of our calculations. Right. I mean, we yeah we can. Um, you know, we put a spectrum in uh, 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 into um, into the computer, and we can we can we can narrow it, okay. Uh, but but we're still gonna you know we inverse we inverse transform that that spectrum, and we're still gonna have a uh, um, uh, a broader time span, okay. So uh, and this is why you know if you if you try to band pass filter too too severely, if you try to you know band pass filter get a narrow band, okay, then that that takes your uh, your uh, arrivals and it makes them very multi-cyclic. You know it, it broadens the arrivals. If you do too much, you know too severe a band pass filter, you know you 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 restrict them to too narrow a frequency band. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and it's operating in the computer. It's operating, um, you know, we have to do something totally artificial, totally non-physical, to to get past the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, and you know, that's not usually very useful. Um, also explains why um, you know we can find, you know, if we if we uh, if we take enough time span, you know, if we if we uh, autocorrelate, cross-correlate those those uh, month-long seismograms into um, into empirical Green's functions, this explains why we can actually get um, a, a reasonable spectrum, you know, from phys with physical-looking waves out of it. Okay, uh, because we have a huge time span, we can actually define a fairly narrow band. Uh, of, of data there. So that's uh, Gabor's proof of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Okay. Um, 
And uh, here's just some comments about, about you know, the use of this second moment function. If you consider the sync function, which is the Fourier transform of the, uh, or the inverse Fourier transform of a, of a box car in frequency, right? So here's a limited band, right? Then you've got this, uh, the second moment is giving you too, too wide a width. Uh, you know, just looking at the sync function, you know, which kind of goes on forever and ever. Um, so, uh, you know, <clears throat> um, if you look at a minimum phase uh, function like an explosion seismogram, um, or a, uh, not a chirp, uh, a sparker seismogram, um, uh, a seismogram from an air gun, say, in a marine survey, uh, you get this very rapid onset. Okay, and it's, you know, it can be reverberatory after that, but you really get your data from that rapid onset and the, and the first peak, that's really where the data comes from. And yeah, sure, in our in our results and you know that we that we interpret, we process that into uh, zero phase wavelets. But um, but the the data really are in that first peak, you know, and and it's the the quality of that first peak and the rapid onset that's what really enables us to process it into very accurate zero phase data too. Okay, so everything comes from that that rapid onset. So uh, you know, Clairbout suggests we try a rise time definition of delta t. Okay, we'll still use a, a second moment for uh, uh, for delta omega. Okay, <clears throat> and um, and here's a rise time definition of uh, uh, that's actually for the inverse mo moment. It's for one over delta t. Okay. And, and you can see where that comes from. It's still f squared over f squared, but here it's 1 over t instead of t. Or what was it? t squared was the second moment. OK, so inverse moment. Uh, just some examples of rise times. Um, here's, a, uh, here's a zero rise time, right? Delta t equals 0 for the, uh, the heavy side step function. Um, or, or even for our, um, um, for our uh, signum function. Okay, um, and here's a ramp, right, up to uh, t max. We do have a number of size ramps that look like that. They start out as a ramp, and um, and the rise time is just t max over two. Okay, so that that's a you know seismologically it's a very sensible definition for for delta t. Um, all right, that's a good place to break it.